to Food for Thought. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau from Compassionate Cooks. I founded Compassionate Cooks to empower people to make informed food choices and to debunk myths about vegetarianism and animal rights. You can learn more about who we are and what we do by visiting our website, CompassionateCooks.com. Hi, everybody. It's been wonderful to hear from so many of you again. Thank you so much for your feedback and your questions and for sharing your stories with me. I love hearing your stories. I really do. And as usual, I apologize to those who I haven't gotten back to yet. I know there's some people on MySpace who reply, who ask me some questions and I promise I will reply. And also before I forget, I'm offering a special price on my cooking DVD. Some of you have asked about that. It's normally $20, but I'm offering it for a $15 special that you're welcome to take advantage of. There's lots of good information on the cooking DVD. We talk a lot about nutrition and food and it will give you some basic skills and tools and resources for making delicious nutritious food. So just go to CompassionateCooks.com and you'll see the special link for this special price. Thank you to all of the sponsors for the podcast. I'm very excited to share today's sponsor with you. Today's sponsor is vegancats.com, whose website is, you guessed it, vegancats.com, www.vegancats.com. Vegancats.com is vegan owned and operated since 1999 and are the proud distributors of the finest vegan foods, natural supplements, and environmentally friendly products for your companion animals. I'm very grateful for their sponsorship, and I do encourage you to check out their website, which apparently they are changing and updating, so you might want to sign up for their newsletter to be notified about when the changes are made. There are many sponsorship levels, which you can check out at CompassionateCooks.com and click on Support Our Podcast if you'd like to contact me. Uh, my email address is podcast at CompassionateCooks.com, or you can go to my MySpace page, which I believe is Compassionate Cook. It's very fitting uh, for Vegan Cats to sponsor today's podcast since today's topic is one which many of you have written to me about. Many feel concerned about the best diet for their dogs and cats, particularly once they become vegan or vegetarian and they start to question the ethics of supporting the slaughter industry by feeding their dogs and cats meat. I know it's a dilemma for many of us, including me. And I have just one piece of advice. My piece of advice, adopt a bunny. I think it's um, the solution to all of this. <laughs> they eat lots of produce and carrots and lettuce and you can give them all of your plant-based foods and they'll just be really happy. So thanks for listening, adopt a bunny and um, take care. I'm kidding, but um, I do. Bunnies are actually really wonderful companion animals and of course when I say adopt, I mean adopt. Do not go buy one from a pet store and especially in the springtime when that becomes a very popular thing to do and unfortunately lots of bunnies are dumped after that time when the kids realize they actually have to take care of them. So um, when I say that, I'm saying it facetiously, but really you don't have to worry about that when you have vegetarian animals. But I do want to say one thing before I continue, and I want to make something really clear. I'm not a veterinarian. I'm just giving you my opinion. This is not medical advice, um, but I am telling you what I know based on my research of professional opinions and people who've done lots of research on this topic. So I want to make that clear. And look, I also want to make it clear that this is my opinion, which is why I assume many of you listen to hear what I have to say about things. And I'm sure some of you may disagree with me regarding this topic in particular, and that's fine. That's your opinion. I'm not presenting doctrine here. This is just what I think based on my research and my experience and my own contemplation about these issues, okay? So here's the scoop. Let's start with the easy one. Dogs do very well on a vegetarian diet. And when I say vegetarian, I do mean vegan, just on a plant-based diet. Most dogs thrive on a plant-based diet, and I say most dogs because there may be some who have difficulty for whatever reason. Some have different issues with allergens that might be in the different food, but you can certainly get around that. There's lots of different options out there, and there's lots of food that you can find that actually made without the, the typical allergens. So it's just a matter of finding the right food, but basically, in general, dogs do great. And any vet who tells you that dogs don't do well, they're misinformed, and hopefully they'll be open to information from you. And if they're not, then, you know, it's, it's important that we have vets that actually respect our thoughts about things. They are the experts, but they also, you know, a good vet or good doctor is just open to hearing what, what their patient has to say. And if your dog is eating meat, I do recommend that you just transition him or her slowly by slowly incorporating the vegetarian food into his or her diet little by little. But 
I, there really isn't much more to say. There are many brands of vegetarian dog food, both kibble and canned food, some of which are sold at vegancats.com. And again, I believe they're going to be expanding their their product line. So you can find lots of things there. There are um, some wonderful foods there right now, and you may even find the food in your larger and smaller uh, local pet supply stores. So you can also support them. And there is lots of information. If you just typed in vegetarian dogs or vegan dogs, you can find lots of good information about about that. Cats, on the other hand, are a different story. Uh, unlike humans or dogs, they, they really are carnivores. Um, they do have very high protein requirements. They don't require plant products in their diet, though they do tend to consume some when they eat the stomach contents of their prey. This, however, does not apply to my cat, Simon. Just so you know, I have two cats, Simon and Schuster. Simon is funny and spunky. He's a total punk. He's manipulative and social and demanding and fickle, and he's gorgeous, and he's long and sleek and skinny and full of energy, and he has a great sense of humor. He also loves vegetables, no matter what I'm eating, but specifically if I'm making like chickpeas, if I just open a can of chickpeas, or if I'm eating quinoa or broccoli or asparagus, fava beans, kale, Brussels sprouts, he loves all of these things. He'll just come down and scream at me to give him these vegetables. So he's a crazy nut bar. His brother, on the other hand, Schuster, um, they were the only two in the litter, just the two of them, and they're still very much in love. They're precious, and they groom each other all the time. They cuddle into a ball when they sleep. They're just inseparable, and Schuster is the complete opposite of Simon, as opposite as you can get. He's gentle, and he's sweet, and he's mellow, and he's quiet, and he's obedient, <laughs> and he's round and paunchy, and he's adorable, and he's trustworthy and predictable, and he never gets into trouble. If there's trouble in the house, we know who to look for, and it's not Schuster. And as much as I hate it, I feed them meat. I know there are people who disagree with me, but I do feel comfortable with my decision at this point. This is a crazy, imperfect world that we live in, and I've made this decision based on, well, I had fed them a vegetarian diet at one point, so based on my own experience and some close calls, and after years of contemplation, I do feed them meat. There are many anecdotal tales of cats th who thrive on a vegetarian, thrive on a vegan diet. Um, but let's just say it makes me nervous based on my own experience from my cats. I'd also like to see more long-term studies of vegetarian cats. I would never say never, and I advise everybody to just you know never say never, never, always be open. And so perhaps in the future, I will change my opinion on this. But as as it stands right now in terms of my own cats and these two guys that I take care of, um, I feel really comfortable with my decision. I did feed my cats a 100% vegetarian diet a while ago, and I will never do it again, not with these guys. I'm not saying there was a direct cause um, and effect kind of situation, but after Schuster was on the vegetarian diet for a while, he developed Addison's disease which is an incredibly, incredibly rare disease in cats. Our vet had the hardest time diagnosing him because it's so rare in cats. You can see it in humans and you see it in dogs, but it was just really difficult to diagnose him. He was having what are called Addisonian seizures. Basically, Addison's is when your adrenal glands don't work. Your adrenal glands stop making adrenaline. So for the rest of his life, Schuster will be on prednisone, and it's been five years now five or more than that, maybe six or seven years, but, and he's doing great. He've, he's had no episodes. He had one tiny little episode at one time, but he'll be on prednisone the rest of his life. And again, I'm not saying that this was caused by the food, but I'm just not taking any chances. I hate supporting the meat industry, but I'm not putting my own cat's life at risk. I also couldn't put enough nutritional yeast on Schuster's food, and he loves nutritional yeast, to get him to take his medication, and he will die without his medication. So unfortunately, it's what I have to do. One of the potential problems that we do know about, a direct correlation that we do see in cats who are fed a 100% vegetarian diet is the risk of what's called feline urologic syndrome or feline urinary tract disease. Male cats are more prone to this than female cats because, well, basically it occurs when crystals form in the bladder and these crystals are unable to pass through the urethra. And it's more common in male cats than in female cats because their urethras are a lot more narrow. And I've witnessed cats passing crystals, these stones, through their urethra, and it is a painful, painful thing to, to witness and, of course, to experience. It is fatal if it's not caught because infection can form and basically back up into the cat and kill them. In an emergency situation, a cat can be catheterized, which is quite an ordeal in itself, I know, because Simon has been catheterized um, several times. And... Um, 
And so a 100% vegetarian diet, even using the commercial cat food that's supplemented with taurine and other essential nutrients, often means that their urine is more alkaline than acidic. So that actually leads to the crystals forming in the bladder. So that's one of the things to be concerned about, especially if your cats are prone to this. It's something to consider. Now, both my cats are prone to it. As I said, Simon, well, they both developed it years ago. Many years ago, I decided to foster a kitten I had fallen in love with at the shelter I was volunteering at. And the problem is that I didn't ask Simon and Schuster how they felt about it. So their bodies literally revolted. They both got blocked. And um, Schuster passed his. It was horrible to witness. And Simon had to be catheterized. And Simon has now had FUS, feline neurologic syndrome, several times since then. I know now that for him, it's related to if he eats any dry food and they've been on a mostly canned food diet their entire lives, but there was a short time where they were getting some kibble. If they get any dry food, Simon gets blocked immediately. And also if he's under severe stress and this was a very stressful time for them. So that's what happened with when I brought that cat in. So this is just something to consider if you're considering feeding your cat a 100% vegetarian diet. Now I do think there is a compromise solution and I really like the suggestions at vegancats.com. They suggest that you supplement the cat food, the meat-based cat food with vegetarian food to at least cut down on the amount of meat that you feed them. Now they do differentiate between what's good for males versus what's good for females because of the former's propensity for urinary tract disease, but personally I wouldn't do more than a quarter of their food with veggie food, and that's just again my opinion and I'm, I'm cautious because of what I've seen in my own cats, but see what they have to say. Check out vegancats.com. I think it's under the FAQ section right now, at least as far as the website um, looks. And I think it's very sound advice. You can try, you know, like 25% vegetarian food and 75% meat. And that will definitely cut down on the amount of meat you have to buy. So I do think that is a compromise solution that we can that we can at least try. In terms of the food I buy for them, as I said, they eat only canned food. And my first criterion for their food is that it not contain byproducts. You've heard this before, right? If there are byproducts in your cat food or your dog food, then I recommend switching brands, especially if byproducts appear in the first list of ingredients. A lot of cheaper, kind of lower grade generic brands um, and other brands, that, um, you, you can just see it on the label, use a lot of byproducts such as um, USDA grade, what's called 4D meat. And these, this is meat that comes from dead, dying, disabled, and diseased animals. That's what the 4D stands for, dead, dying, disabled, and diseased, as well as filler. And the filler is usually in the form of corn, which is difficult for many cats to ingest. So I do recommend kind of a higher quality brand, one that doesn't use byproducts. And when I say higher quality, I realize I'm not saying higher quality in terms of the animal who is killed. I'm talking about higher quality from the standpoint of feeding my cat. So like I said, I understand that it's not a perfect situation. So there's byproducts and then many commercial cat foods are also contaminated by antibiotics, by hormones, by pesticides, heavy metals, and other potentially hazardous materials. So I do highly recommend checking out some brands that have the least amount of well, crap um, in them and do consider organic if you can afford that. There are definitely some organic brands. Newman's Own is one of them and there's other ones you can check out. There are also people who make their own food and you can do this too. You can just purchase, you know, meat at the store and then you can make your own food. There's recipes online for that. And Dr. Pitcairn's guide to dogs and cats do have some recipes for doing so. So again, you can kind of go buy, you know, organic meat. So you're not at least getting the pesticides and the, you know, the antibiotics and stuff in them. And then you can make the food yourself, but um, it is time consuming, but that is another option. The other issue for me in terms of the food I buy is that I make sure it's from a company that doesn't use animals as research tools. This is, again, my own personal opinion. PETA um, is on top of this, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, and you can check out their website, www.iamscruelty.com, iams like the cat food, the pet food, I-A-M-S, iamscruelty.com, where you can find out about IAMS, they're owned by Procter & Gamble, and the horrific conditions of the animals in the IAMS supported laboratories. And you can also find a list of companies that sell food that isn't tested on animals. There's many, many, many wonderful brands out there, many good brands out there that don't test on animals. And this list also indicates which of those brands offer vegan dog food. So it's a really good resource to check out. 
By the way, I've, I've mentioned nutritional yeast already, and I do sprinkle nutritional yeast on their food at every meal. They love it. It. Um, I've actually busted Schuster more than once on the counter, like reaching his paw into the jar and scooping out the nutritional yeast and just licking it off his paw. I did say that Schuster never gets into trouble, but that doesn't count as trouble because it's just really cute. And it was my fault for not putting the lid back on. So anyway, it's also helpful if you uh, have to get medication into your dog and cat, sprinkling a little bit of food with nutritional yeast makes it a little easier and save some for yourself. I never eat popcorn without nutritional yeast sprinkled on it. I love it. There are some other issues related to dogs and cats that I'd like to talk about. Um, there's one issue in particular that has been very difficult for me to talk about, but the main thing for me is that if my experience can help other people and their companion animals, then it's worth me talking about. And I haven't done so in a public way just because it's been so close to home for so long, but it's time to talk about it. And I really do really hope that this information will help you. I, if it helps one person, if it helps one animal, um, then it's worth it. So let me just talk about this. There's a, a cancerous tumor that's seen in dogs, but it's most frequently seen in cats. It's called fibrosarcoma fibrosarcoma. It's so commonly attributed to vaccinations that it's also called a vaccine-associated sarcoma. So let me just give you a little story here. Um, in 2001, I brought Simon and Schuster to the vet for a checkup. To a vet we had been seeing for just a short time, we were still relatively new to the area and really hadn't found one that we loved, but we were taking them to this vet. And the vet said that we, um, we needed to vaccinate Simon and Schuster. And I was really surprised because they're indoor cats, they hadn't been vaccinated for years, but she said, and the risk of them contracting anything was really low. And she said, nope, I've got to vaccinate. And I said, well, you know, I don't really feel that comfortable doing this. I know there are risks involved, but I'm not really clear about what they are. Can you tell me? And she mumbled something about a mouse getting into the house and them getting rabies and just kind of went off on this tangent. But as she was doing this, she was pretty much taking my cats to be vaccinated. And, and I was just kind of stunned. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't quite know how to feel. I was just, well, I didn't really want, but I trusted her. I trusted her expertise. She was the vet. So she takes them into the back to be vaccinated. And this is the moment that if I could turn back, um, if I could turn back time, I would turn back to this very moment and I would have taken those cats home with me and not gotten them vaccinated. As it is, we went home and not very long after that, maybe a couple months, I was petting Simon and I noticed a bump on his upper hip, pretty much right near where his spine is, where his hip met his spine at the top of his um, right hip. And I know their bodies really well, so this was something very strange. And I called the vet immediately and I, and I took him in and the vet felt the lump and she looked up at me and she said this is fibrosarcoma it's caused by vaccination needles i'm taking him into the operating room right now and you can imagine my heart sank i was completely stunned i mean this is exactly what i had been asking her for i had asked her to tell me what the risks were and now you know i'm an expert in fibrosarcoma but at the time i really didn't know anything about it so I, she knew i mean she knew that was the risk of vaccinating them and she didn't tell me so i was really stunned and really upset and i left there very upset i got a speeding ticket on the way home i'll never forget that spot i see it every time i drive from berkeley to oakland or vice versa and i know that exact spot where i was driving home and got a speeding ticket it was a pretty horrific day and i'll never forget it so um, we picked Simon up from the vet and the vet showed me on his x-ray where the tumor was. And like I said, it was way up on his hip near his spine. And I didn't know at the time what she meant when she said, you know, he struggled so much when we were trying to vaccinate him. He just made it really difficult to do it lower. And I didn't know what she meant, but I know now why she said that. You see, in vaccine associated sarcoma, a malignant tumor forms exactly in the spot where the vaccination is given, exactly in the spot. These tumors have been most commonly associated with rabies and feline leukemia virus vaccines, but other vaccines and injected medications have also been implicated. These tumors have become so common that vaccine protocols have changed. They didn't see this 15 years ago, 20, 25, 30, 40 years ago. They didn't see it. They've been seeing it for the last like about 15 years, but before that, they really weren't seeing this. So they've changed the protocols for vaccinations, and I'll tell you what they recommend, and I'll tell you what I know, so you can avoid going through what we have gone through, and so you can pass this information along to other people and also to your vet. 
So the vaccine protocols by the American Veterinary Medical Association, they recommend that the vaccine for feline leukemia be given only to kittens and very high risk cats. The other vaccines, including rabies, they say should be given every three years to adult cats. They also recommend that the vaccination be given in a location that allows for easy removal should a tumor occur. In other words, they recommend vaccinating very low on the limb as opposed to between the shoulder blades like they used to do because if a tumor does occur, they can remove the limb or the foot and thus eliminate the chances that the tumor will recur. Fibrosarcoma is an incredibly aggressive tumor with very rapid growth, but it tends not to metastasize. So if you remove it along with a very, very wide margin on all sides, you virtually eliminate the chances it will ever occur. Now, on the one hand, it's good that the cancer doesn't spread. I mean, it's obviously great. Simon never knew anything was wrong. Simon was never, ever, ever sick, never. On the other hand, um, people have euthanized perfectly healthy cats otherwise, who were otherwise perfectly healthy, but um, who had this tumor that caused distress and pressure on vital organs. So it's really heartbreaking. The tumor doesn't metastasize, but it does send out these little tendrils and spreads and grows very rapidly. So if you can remove a wide margin of like tendons and ligaments, etc., anything it can grab onto, or if you can remove the limb altogether, then you have a better chance of stopping its growth. I know it sounds horrible. I mean, it's a horrible way to treat this when there are other options, and I'll tell you what I know. So when I learned all of this, I realized that's what the vet meant when she said that Simon struggled when they gave him the vaccination. Essentially, she blamed Simon for the, for the fact that they gave him the vaccine on his hip, by his spine, as opposed to doing it low down on his limb. She blamed him for squirming, yet she knew what the protocol was. Clearly, she knew what the protocol was. She knew what the risk was, and yet she still vaccinated him, still vaccinated him despite my concerns concerns and still vaccinated him way, way up high on his, on his hip. She called the next day after the surgery to confirm that it was indeed fibrosarcoma. And here's what she said. My instinct was correct. It's fibrosarcoma. You have two choices. You can amputate or you can radiate. That's it. The odds of survival are very slim. That's it. So by now I was out of shock and I was in rage. Um, I told her that I actually had a third option and that was to find a new vet, which is exactly what I did. And this is the vet to whom we owe everything. If you're in Oakland, her name is Dr. Jenny Taylor and her practice is called Creature Comfort on MacArthur Avenue. She's a holistic vet um, and of course this is where I should have gone to begin with. The tumor returned two and a half months later and everything I read told me that Simon would be dead in a few months. A few months. The prognosis for this is about six months. They give him about six months. That's how quickly this tumor grows. So Dr. Taylor and I have spoken a lot about this and you know what she told me she never would have vaccinated these cats. I'm not saying there's never a time to vaccinate, but the protocols don't take into consideration individual needs. My cats are indoor cats. They did not need to be vaccinated. So please, please talk with your vet about making assessments on a cat by cat basis, not according to some general protocol. And of course, I would recommend that you be present if you do vaccinate and make sure they do it very low on the limb. So Simon's tumor came back after two and a half months and Dr. Taylor went back in to remove it. At the same time, we had started him on some other things, like some Chinese herbs and on something what, uh, called Empower. And Empower is basically a powdered supplement that is used for humans who have cancer. They've been doing a lot of studies on this, especially in Japan. And it's made from Japanese mushrooms, just a variety of Japanese mushrooms. And the idea is that these mushrooms increase what are called natural killer cells. These are the cells that destroy cancer cells. Now, we'll never know exactly what did it, but the tumor stayed away. It stayed away for two and a half years. The odds of the tumor coming back after two surgeries, he was operated on twice, was so high. The, the chance that it would come back after two surgeries was very high. If it's removed once and returns, the odds that it would come back were just huge. But it stayed away for two and a half years. Sadly, it returned. Um, the entire time it was gone, I did keep him on in power but it returned two and a half years later. So we removed it again and it returned right away. And we were faced with a very, very difficult decision. Our wonderful vet referred us to the best surgeon 
in the area and he did a major assessment and was so dismayed that the tumor was up so high if it were just a little lower if it were just a little lower he felt confident that an amputation of simon's entire hip and leg would have taken care of it but as it was the tumor was very high so we were afraid that if we amputated the tendrils would have already been sent out and we would have put simon through this distress for naught so he recommended instead doing a major major surgery which consisted of removing a lot of the tendons and tissues and ligaments just removing as much of the area that he could without compromising Simon's quality of life. And then after a short healing process, we would do localized radiation for seven weeks. For 21 sessions, three times a week, we felt we had no choice. We had no choice. We had to give this a try. And even doing all of this, the odds that it would come back were still 50-50. What I haven't mentioned in all of this is that Simon's personality played a huge role in our decision to do this. Immediately following all of his surgeries, he would bounce back like the maniac that he is. <laughs> he's like, he's a maniac. He's so strong. He gives me strength. So making this decision was a little easier because he's got so much life in him. So we did the surgery. It was very aggressive. He looked like Frankenstein's monster when he came home. It was so painful for him. Um, it was the only time in his life that he didn't want Schuster around. But after a couple of days, only like two days, he gave Schuster the signal. And I have photographs of the first time he let Schuster come over and groom him. It was very sweet. Three times a week, I'd put him into the carrier and drive him down to the specialist. And we started the radiation three times a week for seven weeks and eventually he would just go into his carrier they would bring him right in they were so fantastic and I would go to a cafe for an hour and then I would pick him up so it was the probably the best it could have been and we really had the best possible scenario in just a couple months it will be two years since that radiation ended the only effects on him were that the fur on that part of his body grew back very thin and, and almost white they're both tuxedo cats they have this beautiful black coat um, except for white on their chest and white on their bellies and white on their paws and some on their on their face and now Simon has white on his hip but otherwise he never felt he was never sick he he just handled it so fantastically well every time he was probably like what are you doing like I'm fine why are you putting me through this he never ever felt sick but we knew that the tumor would have killed him if we didn't do anything so that's our story. It's not over yet. The surgeon told us that the worst case scenario when we did all this would be that the tumor would come back after one year. The fact that we're on almost two years is a very hopeful sign and we hope that we'll never see it again, but that's all we can do. I still give him Empower and he gets lots of love. He's a total punk, but I love him to death. You know, if you don't have a holistic vet, you can check out American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association. It's www.ah. VMA for American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association. And if you can't find a holistic vet, you don't, you know, you don't necessarily have to find one, but I just really hope that your vet listens to your concerns and questions. When I mentioned to the vet who gave my cat cancer that I would be going to a holistic vet, she very smugly replied, well, good luck. You can do what you want, but I doubt it's going to work. So she was horrible. I just cannot believe that we went to her. Anyway, so, you know, we just do the best we can. I mean, we, we do the best we can with the information we have, and that's related to my feelings about feeding cats a 100% vegetarian diet. Based on the information I have right now, I'm not confident it's the right thing for them. And I realize that people might be calling me a hypocrite, but that's where I stand on that. As far as dogs, based on the information that I have, I think it's the best thing for them. But like I said, we can reduce some of the meat that we're giving our animals, our cats, by at least, you know, cutting down and, and supplementing with some vegetarian food. I hope this helps a little bit. I, I, I realize this is not a perfect situation, but this is a really imperfect world. And I, you know, we do the best we can. Thank you again to today's sponsor, vegancats.com. Check out their website for your companion food needs, www.vegancats.com. And be well and give your dogs and your cats and your bunnies or whatever critters you share your home with an extra hug for me. This is Colleen with Compassionate Cooks. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.